Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama Chapter number two, text number fourteen. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Translation and purport by the divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. O oh, son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, the sign of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. Purple. In the proper discharge of duty, one has to learn to tolerate non-permanent appearances and disappearances of happiness and distress. According to Vedic injunction, one has to take his bath early in the morning, even during the month of Magh, January, February. It is very cold at that time, but in spite of that, a man who abides by the religious principle does not hesitate to take his bath. Similarly, a woman does not hesitate to cook in the kitchen in the months of May and June in the hottest part of the summer season. One has to execute his duty in spite of climatic inconveniences. Similarly, to fight is the religious principle of the Chatriya. And although one has to fight with some friend or relative, one should not deviate from his prescribed duty. One has to follow the prescribed rules and regulations of religious principles in order to rise up to the platform of knowledge. Because by knowledge and devotion only, and one liberate himself from the clutches of Maya illusion. <coughs> the two different names of address given to Arjuna are also significant. To address him as Kontaya specifies or signifies his great blood relation to his mother's side, and to address him as Bharat signifies his greatness from his father's side. From both sides he is supposed to have a great heritage. A great heritage means responsibility in the matter of proper discharge of duty. Therefore, he cannot avoid fighting. Bandai Hong Shri Guru, Shri Jitapa Brahma, Shri Guru Vaishnavamsha, Shri Guru Bham, Sangrijapam, Sahagana Rajnitam, Vitam, Tam, Sajiva, Sadaitam Tavadrutam Padijana Sadhitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Varam Sahagana Radhita Shri Sakon Vitam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vishaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Vidhanam Namaste Saraswati Vodavani Prasamini 
If one doesn't have a great heritage, then one doesn't have any responsibility. If I didn't come from a great family of Brahman, the Chachra, I didn't have no responsibility. Actually, we are now in the family of Prabhupada. Those who are initiated, they have taken a new identity, a new heritage, Prabhupada's heritage. So actually, to be in that heritage, the Prabhupada Sampradaya, mm -hmm. that is the greatest heritage. So if one enters into that <coughs> Prabhupada Sampradaya, uh, the line of the cyclic succession coming from Prabhupada, then one has the greatest responsibility, the greatest duty mm -hmm. to share this mercy and knowledge of Srila Prabhupada with the world. That's one point you can derive from this purport. And then there is the common understanding of this purport also, to be very tolerant and development. How does this work? Actually, we were discussing it last night at the <coughs> Urban Yoga Center in downtown Melbourne. How to be happy in the modern day world. You see, as long as we base our happiness on the external situation, which is always going to be up and down, sometimes it's very nice, sometimes it's not going to be. Sometimes I'm going to be healthy, sometimes I'll be sick, sometimes I'll be wealthy, sometimes I'll be poor, sometimes I'll be famous, sometimes I'll be infamous, sometimes I'll be unknown. We always face the dualities in this material world. Sometimes I'm Indra, sometimes I'm Indra Gopa, a tiny germ. Sometimes I'm a king, sometimes I'm a pauper. You see? But the laws of karma, we are going through constant rotation in the cycle of birth and death. So many pleasant and unpleasant situations. Not only in this life, but in all the millions of lifetimes we've had here. So, one has to be intelligent and not base their happiness on the external situation. If you're enjoying some happy situation now that is due to your past pious activity, in that happy situation, unless you engage in the service of Krishna, you're burning off your punya, your pious karma, you're burning it off and it will be gone in due course of time. So don't base your happiness on such a flickering or unsteady platform that is not intelligent. If you will instead base your happiness on a loving relationship with Krishna, then you'll become steady in your happiness. Nothing in this material world will ever take it away. Nothing. You can be a Brahma, you can be an Indra, you can be an Indra Gopa, it doesn't matter where you may be. If you have reconnected with Krishna in loving devotion, bhakti, then your actual identity is revived as the eternal servant of Krishna then your actual relationship with Krishna becomes reawakened. Krishna is our eternal well-wishing father. He's our best friend, Suhridam Sarabhutama. If we learn this art of how to dovetail our consciousness with Krishna by dedicating our every thought to him, our every word to him, on every deed to him, in all times, places, and circumstances, then we will not be living in this miserable material existence. Externally we will be living, but internally we will be associating with Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This consciousness is called Krishna Consciousness. 
And this is the purpose of our society, to train the members how to be Krishna conscious. It's not simply being a part of a social organization, some spiritual organization, or have some pious association. Of course, that's later. We have to understand why this This association in the Krishna Consciousness Movement, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, is for bringing us to the point of complete surrender to Krishna. That's the purpose of this society. All the activities we engage in, bowing down, chanting Hare Krishna, taking prasadam, singing and dancing in the kirtan, and decorating the body with tilak, kanti mala, going to the temple, doing service, and contributing whatever we can by our time, our energy, our funds to help this movement. These activities are all meant to elevate our consciousness, to help us get out of the false sense of proprietorship that I am the wood, I am the enjoyer, this is my wife. This is my husband, these are my kids, this is my house, this is my car, this is my money. This is my Bhaktaram Jagatapasam Sarvadokam. Krishna confirms, I am the Supreme Enjoyer because I am the controller and owner of everything. And I am also the best friend of all living in and only those who realize this can be happy. So, the way to be happy is not difficult. You simply have to recognize and understand Krishna is the Supreme Owner of everything. Now, everything is His property. Nirman, nothing is mine. Everything is the property of Krishna. Therefore, everything is meant to be used in the service of Krishna. My eyes, you see, Instead of looking at the pretty girls, I should be looking at the beautiful face of Krishna. Instead of feasting on the pretty girls, I must feast on the beautiful face of Krishna. Feasting my eyes on Krishna. Krishna is so beautiful actually. He's so amazingly beautiful. Each and every one of the, his limbs is full of the most dazzling splendor. Angani yasha sakalendri avritta manti, vashyanti panti kalayanti chiram jaganti, ananda chinmaya sadhusvara vidrahashta, govindam adipurusham samaham vajami. I worship Govinda the primeval Lord, whose transcendental form is full of bliss, truth, substantiality, and is thus full of the most dazzling splendor. Each of the limbs of that transcendental figure possesses in himself the full-fledged functions of all the organs and eternally sees, maintains, and manifests the infinite universes, both spiritual and mundane. Now that person is amazing. Krishna is not a myth. Krishna is more real than anything. Krishna is the very foundation of everything. He's the absolute substantive principle. He's the ultimate entity in the form and the support of all existence. His external potency embodies the threefold mundane qualities in the Sattva Vajrasitana and diffuses the Vedic knowledge regarding the mundane world. We have to understand who is this person, Krishna. His glory ever triumphantly dominates the mundane world by the activity of his own pastimes, being reflected in the minds of recollecting souls as the transcendental entity of ever blissful cognitive vessel. Krishna's pastimes are the sadhus, those who are absorbed in Krishna Bhakti. They're like mirrors. They are reflecting the leaders of Krishna by their very consciousnesses. They are reflecting those leaders of Krishna. 
So we have to understand what is what are the great qualities of this person, Krishna? His unlimited qualities, his unlimited name, his unlimited pastimes, his unlimited sublime qualities. How beautiful this Krishna, how powerful this Krishna, how renowned this Krishna, how knowledgeable this Krishna, how wealthy is Krishna, how famous is Krishna. Krishna is unparalleled of any person in history. No one comes close to Krishna in any way, in any of his qualities. No one is any, any, has anywhere near the strength of Krishna. The beauty of Krishna, the renunciation of Krishna, the knowledge of Krishna, the wealth of Krishna, the fame of Krishna. No one comes close. And that very person who is the source of everything, who controls everything, is willing to be our intimate, personal companion. Simply, we have to give our love to Him. That's all we want. Simply, we have to give our love to Him. He's waiting. He's been accompanying us as the Super Soul within our hearts for millions and billions of lifetimes, waiting for that day when we'll finally give up our rascal so-called independence <coughs> and turn back to Him. So should we wait any longer or should we continue with our little escapade here, trying to be the independent enjoy of the Should we continue with our little revolution of independence from Krishna, and declaration of war with Krishna, or we should make a peace treaty. But now I surrender. What do you think? You should surrender now? You should be fighting with Krishna. No, I'm the Supreme Leader. Anyway, there, there's some questions. Mm -hmm. I used to feel good. I may not say that I'm supreme God, but I will act. Yes, very few people will say I am God. But we all act like we're God, that's the problem. We all act like we're God. Anybody has questions, please write down How to make chanting number one in our daily to-do list? Very simple technique. This is not an order, it's only a suggestion. This <laughs> is pretty heavy, but it's very effective. Don't take breakfast until you're rounded in your and I guarantee you, get your round done every day without fail. You say, well, come on, breakfast is so important. How you, this is a draconian suggestion. But are you your body? Or are you the soul? So would you give more importance to your body than you would to your soul? That's ignorance. So don't. This is, only, this is a suggestion for people who have a hard time getting their round done. You can have no problem getting it done, but I'm not saying you have to do this. But I personally do this. And I love this program. I get my round done every day before I take breakfast. And you rounds always get done. It's a very good technique. Ah. How can chanting help to make kirtan singing better? The japa and the kirtan are the same thing. It's just a different volume of them. Japa is chanting Hare Krishna for your own personal benefit. And kirtan is for the benefit of everyone in the vicinity. In either case, you are connecting with Krishna. If you will learn the art of how to connect, it's not a performance. Kirtan is not a performance. I want to show you all what a great musician I am. I was watching Prabhupada, how he is a famous, I actually have it in my eye here. I have a, a video of Prabhupada doing the kirtan in Compton Square Park. That kirtan went on for three hours with the same melody. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Rama,
Prophet just sat there. He wasn't trying to say, see what a great musician I am. It wasn't like that. He, he, was, just, he was leading us in a meditation. Of course, I wasn't there. I wish I was there. I feel like I'm there when I watch the video. But he's leading all the devotees in a meditation. So Japa is meditation, Kirtan is also meditation. Cremation. Exclamation. What are your views about having your body cremated? Um, since I have disciples, it's different. And somebody's asked you. <laughs> the spiritual masses are generally buried, so they're because their body becomes a space a chirpa. And where their body is buried is chirpa than the disciples. Uh, but for, in general, cremation is recommended in the Vedic culture. Because um, if we're attached to our bodies, which we are, then in the time of death and the soul will hover. If you go to go to a graveyard at night, if you dare. <laughs> there are many souls hovering there around their, their own bodies. You see? There are many ghosts actually in graveyards. So don't go. Just the point. <laughs> so in the Vedic culture, they cremate because then there's nothing and they throw the ashes in the Ganges. The ashes scatter where, the, where you can hang around and associate with your ashes. My dear body, the really ashes. Because they're scattered in the Holy River. So cremation is actually recommended for the general populace. And it's very practical also. I see uh, uh, all these big graveyards. You know? Where's the room? You put all the bodies. In New York City, the, I mean, these big cities, it's very impractical to bury everybody. It becomes so many, you know, the graveyards become so huge, there's not enough room for all the bodies anymore. So, cremation is very practical. It's the Vedic system of cremation. And, and, except in the case of, uh, you know, sadhus, uh, spiritual masters, the disciples can bury the body uh, in the place of uh, pilgrimage. How can I tolerate my friends hit me? <laughs> and be mean. And, and, and when I tell the teacher, she listens to them and not to me. Sounds like you need a new set of friends. <laughs> um. Are these devotees or non devotees? We're doing hitting. Huh? There must be some little kids. <laughs> yeah, I know this is a kid. Obviously. It appears that you're associating with non devotees. You could, I can't imagine a devotee wouldn't hit you. So it's better not better to play with devotee children than one than hit you. That's a better thing. How can I be tolerant if somebody says something improper about my prasadam food? We have to be callous to criticism. I remember my friend Jagar Swami one time um, stated, I remember one day in, in our Back to Godhead office in San Diego, he said, Sanyasis are tough, they can take it. We have to be a little callous to criticism. <coughs> we have to know that we're doing the right thing. We're on the right pathway. We should not be so disturbed by the, the foolish comments of materialistic people. We have to, you know what callous, the word callous means? Just like you work in the garden, you get some blister at first, but then it hardens up and you get hard skin. Your skin hardens and then it, you don't need work gloves anymore because your skin is like gloves already. You get calluses on your skin, it becomes hard like a shell on your skin and builds up after some time. So we have to be callous to criticism. People will criticize. 
when I went to uh, when I went to open a preaching center in Norman, Oklahoma, way many years ago, I was there all alone. I didn't have any association. And uh, when I was walking down the street, somebody yelled out. Somebody yelled from a car, "Get off the damn street! Like, we don't want you here. You know, we don't even want to see you here." So what are you supposed to do? You know, fold up and die? You know, you have to be callous. You've got to be tough sometimes. And people, ignorant fools, say stupid things. You have to just be tolerant. The dogs, Papa said, the dogs will bark, but the caravan will pass. So you just do. You know what your duty is, and you do it. Especially if you go on book distribution, you've got to be really callous. People criticize you like anything if you go on a book distribution. So we have to know what our duty is and we have to stick to it and not be disturbed by so much criticism. Recently many pilgrims died in Kedarama. How as devotees should we view this natural calamity? Karma. Everybody's getting their karma. Nothing the laws of nature are absolutely fair. Nobody is being treated unfairly in all the love karma. Everyone's getting their karma. And actually to leave your body in a holy place, that's a blessing. How do you... Um, Any time you'd like to speak up and ask something? Huh? Huh? The interruption. How do you see a Dvait a Dvaita? Yeah. Looks like a Dvaita. How do you see a Dvaita? A Dvaita philosophy. Can we relate to Krishna consciousness? Yeah. yeah, Dvaita philosophy is the idea that everything is one. In India, South India, there's, there's, there's been a centuries old controversy. Is it Dvaita or Advaita? And Lord Chaitanya resolved it. He said, actually, it's both. And the absolute truth is Dvaita and Advaita. It's one and different simultaneously. So, Advaita is part of our philosophy. We see the absolute oneness of everything because Krishna has manifested himself as everything. At the same time, there is the manifester Krishna and the manifested Krishna. There is Krishna, the energetic source, and there is the energy of Krishna. We see that distinction. The name Vasudev and all the Upanishads. What does this mean? Brahman and Krishna. Well, Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. Vasudev is Krishna. And even if you, the Brahman, the Supreme Brahman is also Krishna. That's confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Confirmed in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Confirmed by the great Acharyas. Confirmed in the Brahma Samhita. The Supreme Absolute Truth is Krishna. Jnanis get attracted to the monophobic. Yogis get attracted to localized paramatma, despite the personal feature of the Lord. He's all attracted to the sacred and the what makes the above category practitioners to limit their alternatives, their attraction to what they are attached to? It is, a, as Prabhupada says, a poor fund of knowledge. It is also an envy of the Supreme Personality of God in, in many cases. <clears throat> Actually, there is a difference between Bhamanandi and Mayabhani. The four Kumaras were Bhamanandi. They had realized in personal Brahman. Shukadev Goswami also, they were Bhamanandi. They had realized the impersonal feature of the Supreme. 
But they weren't envious of that concept of the personality of God. And because of that, later on, when they got the proper association, they became elevated from their impersonal understanding to the personal understanding. Now, my body is somebody who has something against the personal conception of God. If they hear the personal conception, they criticize like anything. That's a difference. The Brahmanandis and the Mayavadis both understand the impersonal conception. The Brahmanandis are open. The Mayavadis are inimical. That's the difference. Is it a gradual process? <coughs> Huh? Yeah, well, I'll, con I'll continue. I'll finish the second one and you can add something if you like. Is it a gradual process of, of um, ascending order to get the stage of attraction towards the personal future? This, every living giving has to go through, except special cells who come in contact with the living. The random process. So what is it? Actually, the devotees' association is required. I know in my own pursuit of self-realization, I, I could, until I actually made, um, until I was submissive to the devotees, I could not go beyond the impersonal mind conception. Even I had the devotee association, but I, until I was submissive to learn from the devotees, I couldn't get beyond the impersonal Ramayana conception. My first books that I read were all from the impersonal viewpoint, that actually you are God, and right now you are playing hide and go seek with yourself. And that's what I was taught. You have to come out of hiding now and be God again, and that's called self realization <laughs> So when I first met the devotees, I thought I was Krishna. And I was chuckling to myself, actually, when Brahma trained me. The first time I walked into the temple, I was chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Krishna. I knew the mantra, I liked the mantra. So I was chanting Hare Krishna, and um, when Brahma trained said, Oh, you're chanting so nicely. And I was thinking, ha, 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 if she only knew that I am Krishna. <laughs> so I, you know, I can relate to this. Because I went through that stage myself, having associated with Mayavadi books, Mayavadi gurus and teachers. So I finally reached the point of realizing that I wanted to surrender to God, because being God doesn't work. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Go ahead, be God. I mean, it doesn't work. And, and you have to, when you have a toothache, you got to run to the dentist. How can you be God when you have to run, when you have to, run to the toilet room? You see, how you can be God? It just doesn't work. It's not practical. So I finally became submissive. Now I must surrender to God, and I was praying for guidance. And then the devotees came. One devotee, Vishnu Jana Swami, came to my town, Austin, Texas. And I was, now I was ready to hear, you see. Because I was praying to God to guide me how to become this perfect servant. And then I was ready. And then I, he preached to me immediately, I accepted it. I understood it and made all the sense in the world. You have to be submissive. And then you can hear and learn from the devotee. Uh, uh, whoever is asking about gradual process, it's like uh, if you are have to reach the top floor of the 27 story building or 100 story building, do you want to go gradually step by step or do you want to take the elevator? So, if you want to reach the floor, otherwise you will be too bad. You may leave the body and go, and you will end up lower. Or even if you go step by step and you slip down, you will go down fast. So, if you know something is that you have to reach the goal, then take the elevator directly. 
And when you directly come, then you don't have to go step by step because uh, Bhagavan features has all the realization in it, Paramatma and Brahman. So why won't you behave? Our life is very short. Very short. Hundred is the lifetime span, and of that we are not even living 60, 70. So you want to take the gradual process, then you should study this verse from the Brahma Samhita. Pantastu kati shatabhattara sampragam yo pai yurta pimana saumoni pungavana so pasti yatra pati chinda pachinda tatle go vindam adipuru shanta mahamajami. I worship um, the fine people of Lord Govinda, who's, who's only the tips of the toes of whose lotus feet are approached by the yogis who aspire after the transcendental and betake themselves to pranayama by drilling of respiration, or by the jnanis who try to find out the non-differentiated Brahman by the process of, of elimination of the mundane extending over thousands and millions of years. So you want, you want to extend your self realization over thousands and millions of years? Then go ahead and take to the path in personal Brahman realization. It will take thousands and millions of years to achieve it. But if you can get perfection right now, take it. Put some prasadam in your mouth and chant Hare Krishna. And immediately you get that the spark of, um, of bhakti. Associate with the pure devotee. How do we know who is a pure devotee? You have to read Prabhupada's books. And you have to see who is a living example of Prabhupada's teachings. They are pure devotees. How should a devotee treat a non-devotee? You must not have come to Bhagavatam class yesterday morning, or the day before yesterday. Because Pallad Maharaj, or Prakshad Maharaj, he's saying, friendly to all living entities. I love Krishna. You're more advanced than us. We're trying to love Krishna. We're hoping someday we can actually love him. We're, you're a, a realized soul if you love Krishna. That's really good. And I'm able to understand his words, but it's becoming difficult to implement them. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Whatever your love of Krishna, you can't implement the word. If you love someone, you can follow. Every, if you truly love someone, you can do whatever you'll do whatever they say without hesitation. You'll have no difficulty serving every single instruction because your heart is totally dedicated. So uh, it looks like in the same category as the rest of us, you're trying to learn how to love Krishna. And that's all right. You're welcome. Can you please show me a way to implement them in a better way? Rupa Goswami says, Dao Gadashvayam. The first step is to take shelter of one of my spiritual master. That's when, it, you see, uh, if you try to be a devotee of Krishna without having a guru, it's very difficult. Krishna directly states in the Adi Purana, he says, Ye me bhakta jana parta, na me bhakta shtate jana ha, mad bhaktanam shi ye bhaktas, te me bhakta matamata. He says, My dear Arjuna, the one who is my devotee, na me bhaktas, he is not my devotee. But the devotee of my devotee, he is my devotee. So if you want to know how to easily take up the path of Krishna Bhakti, take a spiritual master, find a pure devotee and dedicate your life to serving Krishna under his instructions and you'll find it's very easy. Anything you want to become good at, you see, you get a teacher. You want to be a good guitar or sit good sitar player, find a good sitar teacher. Try to figure it out on your own, you'll never become qualified. Get a qualified sitar teacher. And then you can become an expert. Just follow your sitar teacher's instructions. So 
So the same thing in Krishna consciousness. You have to find a qualified, pure devotee teacher and put yourself under his direction. Yeah, this is that if you know, your person is saying, love Krishna, then Krishna's first instruction to Arjuna is, that we give it to Patena. First instruction. Yeah, that's right. Krishna's instructing. Just try to learn the truth by approaching the spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively, then this service unto him. The self-realized souls can impart knowledge unto you because they have seen the truth. It's confirmed also in the Mandaka Upanishad. If you want to learn that transcendental science, you must go to the spiritual master. If you've studied Sanskrit, you know the verbal endings, they have different meanings. It's like gachati means he goes, gachanti means they go, gachat means must go. So, this slok from the Mundaka Upanishad, tad gurum, tad viganam, eva vigitschat, you must go to the spiritual man. Now, Shreya has written a nice question. Why does Krishna put a peacock feather on his head? Because he wants to attract Radharani. <laughs> Radharani is very attracted by Krishna when he wears a peacock feather on his head. Krishna is described as being black and very beautiful. The material world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. We do not consider black to be beautiful. Some people do. And some people consider black to be very beautiful, even in this world. The Negroes think it's very beautiful. Everybody thinks black. We see nowadays everybody wear black pants. Yeah. <laughs> some people think black is really cool. They wear black clothes, you know. Black is a fashion. There are people really into wearing black. They think it's really cool to wear black. But Krishna is not jet black. He is a he is a bluish black. It's like a, a very thick, thick, heavy rain cloud. He's tinned with that blackish blue. He, he's not a jet black. He's a bluish black. A very special kind of black. Why is silk auspicious when silk is gotten from killing silkworms? All I know is Prabhupada wore silk, and if Prabhupada did it, it must be all right. That's all I know, because I, I have silk on right now, I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> because Prabhupada wore silk, I, don't, you know, I, I know my spiritual master is a pure devotee, and if he wore silk, it must be okay. I guess the silkworms are getting great benefit from them when they're, when they're engaged in Krishna's service. Oh. Well, we, then we should not take honey also. In the honey, honey bees also die. <coughs> Can we chant on someone else's behalf? Will Krishna bestow his mercy on them? Actually, it's like saying, well, um, I have a friend, he's trying to get his pilot license, pilot's license. And in pilot's, you have, you know, you're sending anybody to become a pilot, an air pilot, got a license, and even a licensed air pilot here? You are. No, no, I, I, I You got a license? For, I had two lessons. You took some lessons. You didn't get the, the license, okay. <laughs> All right. So, you fly with your instructor. And then, but to get your license, you have to do a solo flight. You didn't do that. 
to get your license, you have to do a solo flight. Now, can somebody else do your solo flight for you? No. You have to do the, your solo flight for yourself. So if you want to be liberated, then you have to fly your own airplane. You can't fly somebody else's airplane for them and get them liberated. If you want somebody else to be liberated, you become an ideal example of Krishna consciousness. Inspire them to seriously take this pathway. That's the answer. Huh? Can you chant on somebody else's behalf and then Krishna bestow his mercy upon them? I said, I will eat. Oh, you eat. <laughs> and there will be automatically. Yeah. <laughs> Does chanting 16 rounds destroy all the path karmas? Not immediately, it takes time. We have tons of, uh, we have some, tons of bad karma. Actually, the, the Krishna says, if you surrender to me, I will relieve you from all of your bad sins. Sarva parpe vyo mokshya shami. So, chanting around is part of the process of surrendering. You have to fully, totally surrender to Krishna. That's when you can get relieved from all of your sins. Regarding the uh, praying for others, I just had a question. In Prahlad Maharaj's prayer, he says that those who engage in bhakti yoga, they pray for each other's welfare. So how do I understand your answer in context of that? Prah Prahlad Maharaj, is not, that's not exactly what he said. Svastiya, the shloka is, Svastiya, the shloka is, Svastiya, the shloka is, Svastiya, the shloka is, Svastiya, the shloka Manastabhajan bhajatam. Let's see if I remember the second line. Svastiya stil vashashva kalyana sivam deyanta bhutani shivam matoriya Manastabhajan bhajatam madok sajaya veshitam naumate raip yahai tuki That's the verse from the Bhagavatam. So, he's saying, he is praying for the welfare of all. He doesn't say devotees do this. Although it's, he implies it by his action, by an example. The point is really the same, but it's not directly what he said. What he did is he is praying for the benefit that everyone should become Krishna conscious. That's what he's doing. It's not for other devotees. He doesn't say that. He's praying that all living entities can become Krishna conscious. That's the actual prayer. But then we also pray. Huh? Then we also are praying for everybody's benefit, not for our own benefit. The thing is, by, by yourself taking up Krishna Bhakti and chanting Hare Krishna, you're already doing that. You're already acting by your own example for the benefit of all living entities. You don't have to specifically pray. But some of the people say, can you pray for me? I say, I already am. For uh, Anybody who's sincere, who fully surrenders to Krishna, they're already acting for the benefit of all living entities, automatically. By one duty and one duty only, fully surrender to Krishna, that covers everything. By fully surrendering to Krishna, you're the best citizen, you're the best son, the best father, the best mother, the best brother, the best neighbor, the best leader, the best everything. Just by that surrender to Krishna. You don't have to do something separate this by surrendering to Krishna, by chanting in the kirtan, by chanting your rounds. Those chantings that you're doing are a actually benefiting every single living entity in the entire universe. Not only human being. Huh? Not only human being, it helps all the... Even insects. the plants. This plants, grass out here. Oh, you have grass here? <laughs> oh, grass. <laughs> the plants back here. You all are doing this, you're doing this kirtan, these plants are getting benefited. You see? Automatically. You don't have to separately say, well, let's, let's chant for the plants so they can get the mukti. 
You don't have to do that. Just chant Hare Krishna to please Krishna, to please Guru, and automatically you're benefiting every single jiva in the entire material world. More than human being in this room, there is so many jivas. How many, maybe a hundred microbes humans are here, but uh, there is so many jivas who have benefited. Billions and billions of microbial germs floating in the air. And they're all getting the benefit of this kirtan. Maharaj I have a question, the same. Like, uh, if someone is dying and the people, they say, you chant the mantra like uh, Shiv, Shiv mantra and the Mahamratyanji mantra, and they offer uh, sankalpa to the pandit, and they do it on their behalf. Do they really get benefited or not? What kind of mantra? Like Mahamratanja mantra, and uh, so many different mantras in India. People, they give the sankalpa to the priest. Yes, those who are not devotees, they can do that thing, because that is mentioned in the Vedas, that they have to perform such rituals. Yeah, like, so... Uh, it takes very long time. They so then how that's how they were delivered. So by the rituals, they get the ritual prasadam and they don't get delivered. They have to take that somewhere. Okay, next question. How can we progress spiritually while working with materialistic people? You have to be you have to have your own spiritual life within you activated and keep it activated. That's why it's very important to chant six, at least 16 rounds every day before you leave your house. Get up early, go to bed early, don't, don't stay up watching television or something in the evening. Have a, a nice simple Krishna conscious evening program. Uh, go to bed, get up early and have a really good sadhana in the morning. You have to have a solid spiritual life going on <coughs> in your heart throughout the day, and then the materialistic influence will not believe you. Please kindly let me know how I should treat serving my godbrothers with love and devotion. What is my responsibility as second generation a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, how I should advance in ISKCON, once of all of Srila Prabhupada's direct disciples and back to Godhead. Same thing you're doing now. Follow, Prabhupada's instructions are there, you have to read the books, you have to follow the instructions. Whether the Prabhupada disciples are still here, or whether we're all, we're all departed, the same thing happens. We all will be departed someday. There'll be a day when there'll be only one Prabhupada disciple left on this planet and he'll leave the body. There'll be no more Prabhupada disciples on this planet. That day is coming. So, you have to be, you have to have complete faith in the words of Srila Prabhupada and you have to follow them. When I want to chant a mantra, I have it in Sanskrit and in Hindi or in English, which explains it better. Which language should I chant it to get the proper benefit of it? Chant it in Sanskrit and your, whatever your native tongue is you speak in and understand the best. Um, I chant, I'm a, an English speaking person, <clears throat> and I chant the mantras in Sanskrit and English. Just like every day I recite the Govinda prayers in Sanskrit and English. A kopi sarva charyatam jaganam dakoti. I'm beside in Sanskrit and in English. She's an undifferentiated entity. Because there is no distinction between potency and the possessor thereof. So whatever language you understand things in the best, you do it in Sanskrit 
And in that language you understand the best, whether it's Hindi, French, German, Spanish, or whatever it is. What is the meaning of Brahma, Bhuta, Prasanatma? Brahma, Bhuta, Prasanatma, the Sokshati, the Kamshati, Samaksa, Veshu, Bhuta, Veshu, Mad Bhaktim, Navatevaram. This means that one should be uh, fully realize that he is a spirit soul, an eternal spiritual being, qualitatively one with the Lord, and that his happiness is in his relationship with the Lord. And then he becomes, in that understanding, he doesn't depend on anything external for his happiness. His happiness is simply based on his spiritual identity as a part and parcel of the Supreme. This is Brahma Buddha. And it's the understanding. And then when you actually put it into practice, that's bhakti. So Brahma Buddha is a preliminary stage when you realize your spiritual identity, you're free from all anxiety because you know who you are. And then Krishna says, Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. And from that Brahma Buddha stage, then they will achieve pure devotion to me. If you have time, how much time do you have? Huh? That's it? We don't have any time? Maybe I can do a brief one. Let's see, here's another one. Why do we suffer continuously in the midst of the chair world? Is it temporary? <laughs> because we foolishly continue to identify with these. Temporary bodies, lifetime after lifetime, that's why we're suffering continually. How to get the strength to face these miseries? By hearing, hearing, hearing from the scripture, from the Vaishnavas, and from the spiritual master. That's how you get the strength. They have to take up also, not just hearing. Hearing means you have to go to the eleven put into practice also. Yes. Hearing is the first practice, and then by hearing you get the inspiration, the strength to actually do it. That is real hearing. You're not hearing only. The no, Prabhupada no. said that that's how... I'm saying that is the real hearing. Real hearing means you hear and you apply it. I'm going to see what I can squeeze in here. This is the last one. If you have time, could you please talk about a few pastimes from the traveling Sankirtan party in Vishnu Jana Maharaj. Actually, my original association with Maharaj was not in the Vajramara party. Before he started that party, I was associating with him. And that party came later on in this consistency. I was with him when he started that party, by the way. Um, I could tell that that. <laughs> Actually, we had a traveling road show um, at one point. A, a traveling rock opera. It was quite an, an interesting thing. It was the story of a hippie who became a devotee, and we would, and we had all, we had three buses. Um, one of one of our other members of the party, our band leader, his name is Mano Ananda. He wrote a song about the days. Remember? Him. He said we had three buses. They were tattered out and old. They were in a parallel world. They were chariots made of gold. It was an amazing thing. We had we took these three school buses. One of them they took all the seats out of it, and they put the altar in the back. We had Radhadamana, our big the big Radhadamana deities, and they were riding them out, and so the deities wouldn't fall over, you know. And they tied them with rope, and they told Prabhupada, "We have Radha Krishna deities, Shiva Prabhupada, and we tied them with rope so they wouldn't fall over." And then Prabhupada said. Oh, and then you can name that naughty boy, Damodar. <laughs> so we, were, we had a very special party. Rob had given his special name. We had a Leela deity who was having his pastimes right there as we drove down the highway. It was amazing. And then we had all, we'd actually all sit in the temple bus and, and, and they're chanting and reading while the bus was driving down the highway. It was a temple, you know. You're in a temple going down the highway. It was really something. And then we also had an equipment bus because we had a rock opera, all the speakers and the costumes and the electric guitars and the bass guitars and the drums and 
you know, on all our, you know, our personal gear, you know, your brahmachari bag, and, you know. It was quite, and we had some, it was quite a thing, and we had also a um, kitchen bus, you know, with, the, with stove and, you know, all the gear for cooking. And in the back of the kitchen bus, there was a bajari room for Radha Dominars. It was quite an amazing thing, there was about 50 of us traveling around, and we'd go to these campuses and do this rock opera. And uh, the height of it was we finally, after the Janmashtami in 1972, we, we hired a hall, a big auditorium in Pittsburgh called the Syria Mosque. And we sold tickets in this big, huge auditorium, and guess who was the guest of honor? Prabhupada himself came to watch our rock opera. <laughs> And in those days, see, now we all applaud in the temple. But in those days in Iskand, applauding was something karmis do. You don't applaud. That was not, that was a karmi thing. You don't applaud. You know. We didn't applaud in the early days of Iskand. So after every number, there was only one person in the audience that was applauding. You know who that was? Kalapad. <laughs> he was applauding after every number. He would applaud. Nobody else would <laughs> So, um, yeah, it was quite a, uh, it was quite an experience. I re really relished those days of traveling in the Vatadamara, uh, the uh, road show it was called. It was very, very sweet uh, days. I remember we were re rehearsing for that Syria Mosque concert. We went to New Vrindavan, which is a, in the hills of West Virginia. There's so many mountains and valleys, it's very, very beautiful. In the summer, it's just really, really sublime. And we were rehearsing for our, you know, the rock opera. So we were staying in a little, it was a little farmhouse up, the, up at the top of the mountain. And so devotees lived there. It was called Maruban. We, we had no... For, our, we had, for toilet, we would use, go out in the woods. And for bath, we would go to the cows, drink their water, and we'd take, take that water over our heads when the cow would drink the water. The cow drinking pond is where we took our bath. It was quite a time. We'd walk down the hill, down to the cow, the cow pond. We'd take our baths there. And whenever you had to use nature's call, you'd just go out in the woods somewhere. And um, so we had to rehearse for our rock opera. So they ran an extension cord through the cornfield out to the edge of the mountain where you're looking over the huge panorama, the valley and the rivers and the mountains. It was very beautiful. And I can never forget one day, we had one song called O Govinda. And Vishnu Janaswami was the singer. The band was set up at the end of the cornfield with the extension cord going through the rows of corn. And he was out there going, O oh, oh Govinda within my heart. Celestial herdsmen, lotus eyed one, your precious gift of love impart. Oh, you who stand behind the sun, you're the one. You're the one in my heart. The rolling rivers flow forth through your veins. It was described in the universal form. And then we were looking at the river flowing down there in the valley. And he's singing about the, Vishnu John Swami is singing about the universal form. And there it is. We're looking at it. And he's singing about it. I mean, it was really powerful. I just wish we had taped it and videoed it. Oh, my God. We didn't, we didn't have iPhones with videos. We it was some of the most amazing memories. They just, they just sit in my heart and I just relish the, the sweetest memories of those days of traveling with Vishnu John Maharaj with the, the Varsha. So anyway, that's a little, a few little drops of nectar there. Yeah. What about the, the break, uh, breaking of the Which one? Breaking the Ganga. Oh. Well, my, oh, in Dallas? All right, I'll tell that one too. Well, I was, at the time I was a hippie songwriter, and I hadn't really joined yet, but I was attracted to the devotees. I was associating with the devotees. And, in, in Austin. And uh, 
There was a, we didn't have Rafa Yacha Festival except, I don't know, it was only in San Francisco, but we used to have what was called a Lord Chaitanya Festival. And those are pretty ecstatic. They had a huge paper mache deities of Gornitai about as, as tall as the ceiling. And they were taken on down the street. These huge deities of Gornitai, about, you know, at least as tall as the ceiling, and maybe 12 feet high, and a big kirtan. It was very attractive. So anyway, there was a Lord Chaitanya Festival in Dallas. We all drove up there. And um, I, the, te the Dallas temple was just a little tiny duplex, you know. And we all crammed this little tiny duplex. And then the next day, I chanted, uh, we all, in those days there was no Tulsi beads from India. You had to go to a hobby store and buy some wooden beads and string your own. There was no beads from India in those days. We didn't have any connection with India yet. <clears throat> Nobody said he had gone to India and come back yet. Only a few were over there, but there was no thing going back. Prabhupada hadn't started the temples in India yet. So we all, some, someone said, let's go to Tandy Leather Company, we'll get some beads. So I, I went over there and got some beads. I strung my top of beads. I chanted six, my first 16 rounds that day. And I've been chanting 16 rounds ever since. And, um, but anyway, I, I was a long haired iffy and I was a beard and the hair down to the shoulders. And uh, so they need somebody to play the Kazi in the drama. And I, I, was, I had the costume already there, I didn't need a wig. You know. <laughs> so in this drama, they had a drum, it was an actual clay madonna that was already broken. It was already a useless drum, but it, you know, from the front it looked like a good madonna. So in the play, they had me smash the Vedanga. And, it was, it was, it was, and then that week, I went back down to, to Austin and I shaved up. And uh, Vishnu, I heard Vishnu Dhan Maharaj on the, on the phone with the temple president in Dallas, uh, Madam, let's see, what was his name? Mohan Ananda Prabhu. He said, guess what? The Kazi shaved up. <laughs> They called me the Kazi after that. <laughs> that was the latest news, the Kazi. So anyway. Oh, what were you talking about? Oh, that was later on. That was in Atlanta. That wasn't the Radhama. Yeah, that's another pastime. They did the same thing. This was an amazing thing. Yeah, they, it was absolutely phenomenal. We were with Prabhupada in 1975. <clears throat> uh, he, he, he had preached in Caracas, Venezuela. Then he flew up to Miami, and then he flew from there to Atlanta, and about 300 devotees came to be with Prabhupada for many, many days. It was the most amazing thing to see every day, Prabhupada giving morning and evening class, the morning walks, Going up, I got my Brahman thread there, Prabhupada, my own private meeting with Prabhupada, he gave me the Gayatri Mantra, it was a very sweet time. And uh, the Bodhis had taken the, had taken the actual um, words from the Chaitanya Charvamrita about the Kazi, the pastime of the Kazi, smashing the drums. They had taken it right out of the scripture, and they did, it, they did this play where the Kazi smashed the drums. So Prabhupada was sitting there, watching it. And Prabhupada couldn't believe, he didn't realize it was already halfway broken. He couldn't believe they were actually smashing in Madunga. He was like, he was, his, I saw, it was amazing, he just had the most amazed look on his face that they would actually broken in Madunga. <laughs> yeah, that was a sweet pastime too. Prabhupada was amazing, they, they smashed in Madunga. He was amazed. You know, see what the devotees have done in this drama. <laughs> so, I guess we'll stop here and uh, go on to the next phase of the program, which is the shot and distribution. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, everyone can come forward one after the other and take the seat of the lotus feet. If you want to take the seat of the lotus and Maharaj will give you some shot and distribution. And at the same time, if you want to offer some me, you can do the same next to you. You can please come up. Thank you.